Hey, fellow Utahns. Ty Burrell here. I may be Oregonian by birth, but I'm all about Utah nowadays, especially when it comes to natural history and science. Did you know our Natural History Museum of Utah has the largest display of horned dinosaurs in the world? It's basically the visitor center from Jurassic Park minus the screaming. As a curious kid, some say prodigy, I've always had this dream of becoming a scientist. When I heard behind the scenes that the Natural History Museum of Utah was canceled this year, I was crushed. But after I put in a call with my pal Jason at the museum, he agreed to take us through virtually in a robot. I'm so excited to take us behind the scenes and share science with you. I'm not saying I'll come out of it having discovered the sixth dimension, but stand by. Okay, people, let's get curious. This is amazing. Just running around a museum in a robot. 2020, am I right? Are you ready to check out anthropology? Oh, no, I'm good. I've got, I've got plenty of soy candles and oversized sweaters. Uh, different kind of anthropology. Think baskets, stone tools, and rugs. Oh, okay. Yeah, that still sounds like anthropology. So this is a basket case. Hey, as am I. So these are our modern Navajo baskets. And this one is my favorite. You see, it's about how the galaxy was created. See, the holy people were carefully laying out the sun, the stars, and the moon, but the mischievous coyote got impatient, and so he yanked away their blanket, and everything was scattered across the sky. And here I thought, wily coyotes just painted tunnels on brick walls. <laughs> well, these are promontory moccasins. Oh my goodness, Jason, your, your feet are very small. I wouldn't try them on. The oils from my feet would destroy them. Oh. A, a friend of mine had foot oil, and he said it was the worst. These shoes give our anthropologist evidence about how people migrated across North America centuries ago. The way they're made with this tuck toe here, it's similar to shoes of societies in the North. So people who made these in Utah probably descended from a culture that came from what's now Canada. Huh. Wait a minute, Jason. What, what's in all these? Hey, I love that curiosity. These boxes contain the most important anthropological artifacts that the museum has. That's dirt. You, you, you know that's dirt, right? Well, yes, but soil and pieces of pottery are some of the most important things that we study because they tell us exactly what was in the environment at the time. Wow. To explore more about our anthropology collection and research, we set up a socially distanced interview with Dr. Glenna Nielsen Grimm and Dr. Elizabeth Lauterbach. A huge thanks to Ty Burrell for helping us all stay curious during this very unusual behind the scenes. In more normal times, behind the scenes would be our chance to share the wonders of the museum with all of you in person. While that's not possible this year, we're psyched to have you join us for this one of a kind virtual behind the scenes event. Our guests tonight are the museum's curator of archaeology, Dr. Elizabeth Lauterbeck, and our collections manager of anthropology, Dr. Glenna Nielsen Grimm. You'll have a chance to ask them questions in a live Q&A right after this. So save those questions. But first, I'm thrilled to be here with them in the museum's anthropology collections. Let's start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, remember that I'm an entomologist. I'm a guy who studies bugs. So I have a really fundamental basic question to start with, and that is, can you tell me the difference between archaeology, anthropology, and ethnography? Sure. So the anthropology collections are made up of archaeological and ethnographic collections. Archaeological collections contain objects that were made by the first peoples of Utah. And these objects date as far back as 12,000 years ago. And these were excavated from sites right here in Utah. We do have objects from other states, but the majority of our collections are from Utah. Ethnographic collections contain objects that were made by contemporary indigenous communities. Again, mainly from Utah, our Utah native tribes, but we do have objects from indigenous communities across the world. And what are the tribes that are in Utah? We have eight federally recognized tribes in Utah. That's um, Goshute, Skull Valley Goshute, Ute, Ute Mountain Ute, um, Paiute, San Juan Southern Paiute, Navajo, and Shoshone. And are all of those tribes represented here in these collections? Yes. You're the curator of archaeology here. Can you tell me a little bit about your work here in the collection and in research? Sure. 
So I oversee the archaeological collections. That means I look at what donations are coming in, we make big decisions on which objects to take in, which objects should be researched, things like that. And then my other responsibility is to do research on our collections. I also teach students and teach classes in the anthropology department. And what's your major research theme? So I'm an archaeobotanist, and so that means that I study plant remains from archaeological sites, and these range from little seeds and fruits to twigs um, to leaves. But I also study plant residues, so microbotanical remains. These are remains you cannot see with your naked eye, such as starch granules, pollen grains. And these residues are embedded in, in many of the objects in our collections. What can we tell by looking at the diets of people from uh, the past? Well, uh, I'll give you an example of some recent research that we've been doing. Um, this is in Escalante in southern Utah, or Escalante if you live there. And um, there what we found was um, plant residue, starch residue, on ancient stone tools. These are monos and metates, grinding stone tools. Um, we found evidence of processing of wild potato. And the more and more we started digging into the literature and talking to the people around the community, turns out that Escalante Valley used to be called Potato Valley, and that this potato was once really important to the people living in the valley. That resource has been forgotten, so our research has kind of brought that potato back, not only to the people in Escalante Valley, but to the indigenous communities in, in Utah and to pioneer communities. And um, it's really um, helping to establish that cultural identity and cultural heritage that's been lost all these times. So I remember reading that the potato actually was a new world uh, plant that was uh, utilized by the, the indigenous people here and then only later um, exported to, to Europe and, and the old world. Is that correct? You're thinking of Selenum tuberosum. That's the potato we buy in the grocery stores. The species that we're talking about is Selenum jamesii, and this is the Four Corners potato, and it's native to the Southwest. It is not, does not come from South America. Maybe millions of years ago it did, but it's its own species native to this area. What's the difference between the Four Corners potato and the potato that we can go and buy at Smith's? The Four Corners potato is way more nutritious than what we buy in the grocery store, even the organic red potato. And even though they're, they're small, uh, they are very, very nutritious. So one of the interesting things that we found is that, well, first we found the starch residue. And as we were trying to identify what this potato starch was, we actually found um, or discovered a, a population of the potato growing about 100 meters in front of the site. And this was like the most exciting thing to us because that was validation of our, of our starch residue results. Um, and then the more and more we've been working on this project, this is a project funded by the um, National Science Foundation. And um, we've been finding that these populations of potato, especially in Southern Utah and in Southern Colorado, are associated with only archeological sites. Whereas the other populations down in um, New Mexico and Arizona, kind of where they originate, they're not associated with archeological sites. So we uh, propose the hypothesis that people were transporting these potatoes northward. So your research really gets into the, the movement of, of agricultural products or agricultural plants uh, by humans, right? What other kinds of, of foods were they eating, do you know? Oh. A huge, broad range of foods, um, wild foods such as wild grasses. They were also eating exogenous domesticates such as maize, um, uh, beans, and squash. Those were all domesticated in Mesoamerica but transported northward to the southwest. The Three Sisters? The Three Sisters, that's right. But I would like to include the Four Corners potato into that because uh, um, we also believe that that was domesticated, but it was domesticated here in, in the Four Corners region, not in Mesoamerica. And so how does that kind of research inform what's happening now with, with modern peoples? So we do have uh, a, a lot of different branches to this project. One of those is collaborating with scientists at the USDA. 
um, potato geneticists and breeding experts. So we've been doing a lot of breeding experiments. What we're trying to do there is that we are trying to increase the gen genetic variation of this potato. What we don't want to have happen is what happened with the 19th century uh, great Irish potato famine where they were relying on one species of potato which was infected by a fungus, potato blight, wiped out their entire crop. Glenda, you're the collections manager here. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? What we do is we have both reposited collections that come to us from sites that have been excavated on public lands and they come here and we curate them here. And we also take in collections that have been donated to us or that we actually will commission and have them come here. But what we try to do here is to um, research and care for and conserve objects. So Elizabeth had mentioned that you make decisions on what objects to accession into the collections. How does that decision process work? Often I'm contacted as a collection manager, so somebody will send an email to me and say, my mother or my grandmother or I was, um, has given me an object, it's a basket or a, uh, you know, some kind of a, a blanket or something that they have received and they would, don't know what to do with it. Um, or they think that it should come to a museum. And so they'll contact me and say, are you interested in this? And so I usually will reply, yes, send me a picture first and then we look at it and I try to get information about where it was, where it came from, when it was made, um, what they know about it. And then I send that out to my curators and they will look at it. So Alex Greenwald, who Dr. Greenwald is our curator of ethnography. And so she tries to oversee the collections that we t bring in that are ethnographic. And um, Dr. Lauterbeck, or Elizabeth, she will look at the archaeological collections and the problem we have with archaeological collections is sometimes if they're coming off public lands, we should not have them because they've been illegally obtained and we try not to have illegal collections here. Um, it's against the law to have some objects and so we don't take them in. So that's one of the other things that we have to do is we try to get what's called a provenience or provenance for these objects. And if we can determine that they came from public lands, like BLM lands or some other kind of lands, we'll contact those agencies and see if we can't get those objects back to them. Otherwise, we will collect them here. We also try to make sure that the, um, the objects in our collections pertain to Utah. So that's our mission, is to um, try to you know, illuminate the past of Utah and so everything that we try to bring in, we try to pertain some way to the research or the indigenous peoples here in Utah. So I would assume that these objects have cultural significance to the people still living here. Yes, they do. And we always um, like to, part of the mission of our, our museum is to illuminate the past and we try to really do that with our indigenous populations here in Utah. One of the great things about our collections here is that for instance, these baskets right here. These are all coiled baskets. They were made in Utah. But what I like to let people know is that we have an unbroken tradition of basket making in Utah. We have an early basket, prehistoric one, that dates to 10,000 years ago. But one of the coolest things that I think about our collections, especially our basketry collections, is that we have an unbroken or continuous representation of a technology that started almost 10,000 years ago in Utah and has never ended they are still making baskets. And this tells us a lot about the peoples that lived here in Utah and the indigenous cultures that we have now. This is part of their heritage and this means so much to them. Elizabeth Glenna, thanks so much for joining us tonight and for everything that you're doing here at the museum. Coming up next, my colleague Paul Michael Maxfield will be hosting a live Q&A with Elizabeth. So get your questions ready, stay tuned, and we'll see you in just a moment. Hello everybody, my name is Paul Michael Maxfield. I work at the Natural History Museum of Utah, and I'm glad to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining us for the first of five nights of Behind the Scenes Reimagined. We hope you're having a great time, and we're going to do our best to keep the party going. As you know, it's Anthropology Night at the museum, and I'm joined by NHMU archaeologist Dr. Lisbeth Lauterbeck. For the next half hour or so, Lisbeth and I will be taking questions from Facebook, YouTube, and NHMU's websites. Folks, if you've got questions about archaeology, Lisbeth's got answers. So send us your questions now. Let's get started. Dr. Lisbeth Lauterbeck, thank you for joining us. How are you? 
I'm doing great. Thank you, Paul Michael. Excellent. Um, well, uh, so uh, we have a bunch of people uh, who have joined us and they are interested in you and archaeology and have a bunch of questions. Um, let me just ask you just to get our kind of conversation going here. Um, what, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience as an archaeologist. How did you get into it um, uh, and, and what kind of projects have you been working on? Sure. Well, um, I was first introduced to archaeology because I was interested in learning about what plants were around in the past. And I came a bunch across a bunch of literature that had to do with paleoecology and archaeology and people using plants in the past. And I thought that was really um, an interesting field and kind of allowed for some creative thoughts and um, which is what I was kind of looking for. Um, I really love archaeology because it is very creative. Um, we are basically prehistoric detectives. We go out in the field, we excavate a site. Um, the site is basically a lot of materials that have been left over thousands of years ago. And we have to put together a story based on that evidence. And it's usually not a lot of evidence. Um, but that allows for some really creative ways of thinking and some interesting collaborations with other subfields such as geography, geology, botany. Um, so it's just a very um, all-inclusive field and it's, it's just really fun to be out there. Um, and the field work is great. I mean, you get to basically get paid to go out and hike and play in the dirt and find really <laughs> cool things. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a really great um, career choice and field to work in. Uh, that's awesome. So we have a question from Anna in Utah, and she'd like to know how long have you worked for the museum, and how long it takes uh, to get a degree. Well, that's a great question. I've been at the museum for about six years now, a little over six years, and. Um, I had an interesting path and not a lot of people take the same paths, you know. Um, the advice I always give my students is that you have to create your own path. So I started out actually studying psychology and plant biology in undergrad. I took six years off and I worked in an investment, investment bank making more money than I make now. <laughs> um, and, and, but I wanted something, you know, a little bit more fuller for, for my life. Um, so I applied to graduate school. I didn't get accepted the first time because I never took an anthropology class. So I just moved to Reno, Nevada, took a bunch of classes, applied the following year. I got accepted. I got accepted in the field school and just took off from there. It took me 10 years to get my PhD. That's longer than most people. I think uh, seven years is about right. But um, you learn how to become, you know, a professional archaeologist, you learn how to become a teacher, you learn how to, um, to become a, a whatever analytical tool you're using, a specialist in that. Um, so it's, it, it takes a long time because you are doing a lot of different kinds of work and you're making connections with other people, other academics, um, and things like that. So that was my path, kind of windy, <laughs> but it landed me the, my dream job. So I'm, I'm lucky. Well, uh, and we're lucky too to, to have you. Um, Jan in Cottonwood Heights is wondering if archaeology and the various research fields at the museum, um, if they're difficult to get into. What would you say to that? Different fields in the museum, is that what the question was? Yeah, like is it difficult uh, to, to get into these fields? Um, I wouldn't say difficult, but you have to be motivated, you have to be committed, and you have to be persistent. Um, you have to work hard. Um, not a lot of people would dedicate 10 years to going to school. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if, you, if you have those, you know, um, as values, I, you can definitely, it's, I wouldn't say it would be hard. Um, 
I think you have to find somebody who's going to give you that first opportunity. And then you have to show them that you are a hard worker, you're committed, and, um, and then opportunities will evolve over time. That's what happened in my case, at least. And I'm sure if you're passionate about uh, whatever it is you study, that will help carry you through all the kind of difficult times that you might encounter. Um, right. Aurora Parker uh, is wondering if everything in the museum comes from Utah. Aurora, what a beautiful name. <laughs> yeah, great name. Um, no, not everything um, in our collections comes from Utah. The majority does because that is our mission. Our mission is to illuminate the cultural history of Utah. Um, but we have objects from, from Mexico, from South America, from Africa, from Polynesia. And a lot of those objects come because maybe we had researchers that were working in those areas and would bring back objects. Um, or we, if we know we have a researcher that works in a particular area, then we're more apt to accept donations and collections that are from that area. Um, so we do have objects from other area. Northwest Coast, we have a lot from there. We just accepted a pretty large donation and, and most of the stuff from was Northwest Coast. Yeah, um, Katie was wondering um, uh, how we decide which objects uh, we accession into the collection. That's a great question. Um, we have to think, and I mean we, meaning my whole department, we have three curators and three staff members. Um, and we have to think, one, does it fit in the scope of our collections? Meaning, is it from Utah or is it from somewhere that would be relevant? Um, are the objects unique? Do we already have a lot of that kind of type of objects? So if we do, we might not want it in our collections. We have very limited space. Um, so we're not gonna take objects that are just gonna take up space. They have to have a purpose. They have to have, um, another thing is they have to have re research potential. Um, and often that comes from what do we know about the object? Where did it come from? Um, if we don't know where the object came from, when it was made or anything like that, then we're probably not going to accept it because that in archaeology, if you don't have context, you don't have anything. Yep, that's that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Katie uh, in Salt Lake is also wondering, how do we decide which objects uh, to research? Well, that's up to what your research questions are. My research centers around what foods people ate and, and why did they choose these foods? Um, so I'm in, the objects that I'm interested in, in are um, you know, food processing objects such as monos, matares, grinding stones, basketry. Um, I'm also interested in um, huge bags of soil, which I have here. <laughs> I'll just show you one of these bags. So we have a lot of bags of soil. These are not very interesting objects, obviously, <laughs> but they are so valuable for research because um, you could extract, you know, um, starch residues, pollen grains, little seeds, little twigs. That tells you a whole swath of information. What plants are growing there? What foods were people eating? What was the environment like? Um, so these bags of soil aren't the most attractive object, but they are incredibly valuable for research. Um, this, so those are some of my objects that I'm interested in. Um, but I know that others, um, my colleague, Tyler Faith, he is, he, he's a zoo archeologist. So he looks at animal bones. So um, again, knowing what animal species were around in the past and what kind of um, animals people were hunting in the past and things like that. So it really depends on your research questions. Okay, that's that's that whole bag is filled with dirt. Oh yeah. And that that dirt has all kinds of archaeological secrets just waiting to be uncovered. That's right. And you know, that's why they're collected. This this bag was collected by 
actually one of the first directors of this museum, Jess Jennings, um, back in the, I think this was probably back in the 70s. Um, and he knew that it was his job as an archaeologist to collect, you know, kind of over collect, collect as many samples as you can because you're collecting for future researchers. And these, these are going to be cataloged in the museum. And, you know, future researchers like myself are going to come to these objects, these bags of the sediment, and be able to glean some more information than they would have 40 years ago. So um, it's really good forward thinking, um, collecting these bags of sediment. Yeah, I think a good example of that is, you know, just probably wasn't even thinking about starch grain analysis, you know, and, um, you know, and here we are, you know, 60 years down the line, here comes Dr. Elizabeth Lauterbeck uh, with a bunch of new questions and can use the dirt that um, Jess Jennings has created, uh, has collected to um, start asking some, some uh, brand new questions. Yep. And then that's the other thing is that there, there aren't a lot of, you know, these, these, a lot of these come from um, cave archeological sites that are caves or rock shelters. There's not a lot of those in Utah left to excavate. So we have to use um, the objects that are in our collections if we want to um, you know, examine those sites again using different eyes and different perspectives. Well, we got a lot of questions about potatoes and good thing because you are um, the unofficial queen of potatoes. Um, right. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, um, uh, the Four Corners potato. Sure. So the Four Corners potato, Solanum jamesii, is native to the Four Corners area. It is not native to South America. This does not come from South America. You know, maize, beans, and squash, those were all domesticated in Mesoamerica and transported up here. Um, but this little potato is native to this area. Um, and it's a really interesting plant. <laughs> it's um, incredibly resilient. It can um, persist underground for several years. Um, and that's really important for, you know, growing in the Southwest because we have such variable climate and unpredictable rainfall um, that those tubers have to um, survive somehow. And that's how they do it. They just don't, you know, produce any shoots that go up. They just stay underground. Um, but what we found uh, was really um, an interesting story. It, we actually found, we were working on a site in Southern Utah in Escalante called North Creek Shelter. And again, I was interested in what foods people were eating. So I was extracting starch residues from all the monos and matates from that site. There was over 200. Um, and I, was, I found potato starch and I didn't really understand why I was finding potato starch on these you know, 10,000, 11,000 year old tools. Um, but it turned out Escalante Valley used to be Potato Valley. And these potatoes were very important to the native communities that live there. Um, they're still important to native communities throughout the Four Corners region. They were important to the descendants of the pioneers. Um, we had a story, um, uh, Delane Griffin, he's a 96 year old direct descendant of the pioneers who would eat these potatoes, go out and forage for them during the Great Depression. Um, they were important to some of the cavalrymen that came through Utah in the 1800s. Um, so this story about this food resource just started to grow and grow. And we realized that it had just been forgotten. A lot of people never knew Escalante Valley was called Potato Valley. They didn't even know that potatoes were still growing in that valley. So we're working now with native communities, pioneer communities, um, restaurants. We're working with the USDA Potato Gene Bank, and we're trying to bring back this potato to these communities and to conserve this really important food resource. Wow, that's, that's really amazing stuff. Um, Rachel in Salt Lake City wants to know, are the potatoes um, that were originally grown in Potato Valley, so the Four Corners potatoes, um, have you tried one? And um, uh, are they any good? Oh, they're absolutely excellent. <laughs> well, I mean, they taste, I think they taste better than the normal white potato you buy in the grocery store. Um, 
but they're, they're more nutritious. So they're better for you. And, um, the way we cook them is uh, we've sauteed them with butter, salt, and pepper. They're delicious. The skin is crunchy on the outside and the um, starchy insides all mushy and, and nice. It's got kind of an earthy taste. Um, and we put them in our chicken soup because they fit nicely on your spoon. You know, these are wild potatoes. So they're, they're small. They're about the size of a quarter. Um, now, the reason the potatoes in our grocery store are large is because those have been domesticated. And over millennia, humans have chose, chosen large tubers. Um, but that brings me to another part of the project is which we are investigating. Uh, we have a National Science Foundation grant to look at evidence um, for transporting these potatoes. We believe that, that people thousands of years ago transported the potato and um, maybe we're on the way to domesticating it. Um, so maybe choosing those larger tubers would have been um, something that they would have, a, a desirable trait that they would have wanted in this potato. Um, but it's uh, very interesting because the populations in Southern Utah are all associated with archeological sites. The uh, potato also grows very abundantly in Mesa Verde. It grows in Chaco Canyon National Park. Um, grows in Canyon de Chez. All these really well-known archaeological sites have the potato growing there. Um, and we believe that people, you know, trade was happening back and forth for thousands of years. And we believe that people were transporting this potato all around. So, um, so yeah, stay tuned for those results. If we find evidence that um, people were transporting them, then that's evidence that that's kind of the first step in domestication. And we don't have any evidence right now that plants were ever domesticated here in, in the American West. So that would be the first evidence for that. Well, interesting that you bring that up. Uh, Mike in Salt Lake City has a, a question. He wants to know, how do Four Corners potatoes relate to Pacific Northwest Wapato? Excuse uh, me if I'm uh, mispronouncing that. Uh-huh. Um, that's a totally different genus. And... Um, so it's not even related to the potato. And All I, right. Well, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mike. <laughs> that was a good question, though. I was, I, I thought you might be onto something there. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a lot of plants with common names of potato. There's one called Indian potato. It's not a potato at all. It's totally a different family, different genus, um, and it's got like a tuberous root, so it looks like it would be, but it's not. All right, one more potato question. Uh, Tommy, who is six years old, shout out to Tommy. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, he lives in Bountiful and he wants to know how old the Four Corners potatoes are. That's a great question. Um, I don't know how long they've been growing in this region. Um, I'm, I'm guessing thousands and thousands of years. Now we found evidence that people we're eating it and processing it 10,900 years ago, so almost 11,000 years ago. But I think it persisted on the landscape for much longer than that. And I just don't have the exact answer to that yet. Um, but I do know that researchers in South America have found that the, um, the potato growing there is very, 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 very old. Uh, so, um, and again, I don't have the date in my head, but... <laughs> way long before people were there. <laughs> yeah, and that's, do you think that's a question that we're eventually gonna be able to answer? Yeah, there's um, there's some really great um, potato researchers out there. There's including one um, here at University of Utah, Lynn Bowes, she's a specialist in, in Sol Solanaceae, which is um, nightshade family, which potato is part of. Um, and she's been doing some really interesting work on, on, on kind of just how old um, selenum, the genus, is. And again, I'm just, I'm not recalling the exact date. Um, I can think of her paper, <laughs> but I can't, can't think of the date. Um, and yeah, there's, there's potato, other potato people out there besides me who are studying um, the entire genus and family and really looking at the genetic history. Who knew there was so many potato people out there? 
And, uh, you know, Tommy, I'm sorry that we don't have an answer for you right now, but uh, maybe in a few years, you will be the person to solve how old the Four Corners potato is. Um, so Andrea in West Jordan uh, was visiting the museum today and uh, she was up in Native Voices. She was looking at the cradle boards and she noted that, noticed that two of them were covered with what looked like a blue silk. And she was wondering if that uh, if they were covered with the blue silk to prevent damage from lighting um, or if there was another purpose. Yeah, so um, we uh, at the museum here, we have what's called an Indian Advisory Committee. And this committee is made up of a member from each of the eight federally recognized tribes. And they worked very closely with our exhibits people and our collections manager to develop that exhibit. Um, and one of the requests was to cover um, the cradle boards um, out of respect for, for those um, culturally sensitive objects. Um, and, and over time, you know, we learned there's, there's other requests like that and um, that's the best thing about this committee is that there, there's always, we're lear always learning something new about what's in our exhibits, um, how to interpret them, what it means to the native communities in the state. Um, and so we absolutely respect all of their concerns. And um, so that's the reason why those, those blue cloths are, are draped over them. Do you, do you happen to know um, what, uh, um, was so uh, culturally sensitive about the cradle boards? Um, you know, I'm, I think it has to do with spirits leaving. Um, I don't know, I'm not the one to speak on, on the behalf of the native communities, but I recall maybe something about that, um, but that would be a question um, that I should bring to the committee and ask and, and just remind myself what it is, but um, yeah, oftentimes you'll see um, objects that, um, you know, might have something different about them. And, you know, maybe something I should bring to the committee is should we have a sign that, that explains that? Um, so that could be something I could ask. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's, that's uh, really interesting stuff. And I, um, I just think, uh, I have so much respect for how closely uh, our anthropology department works with uh, the local American Indian communities. Um, I, I've always uh, just been astounded um, by how respectful you guys strive to be. Well, um, Archer in Tooele wonders what the oldest archeological item in the collection is. That's a great question. Um, I don't know if we have a specific object we have a site that's one of the oldest sites um, in, in North America, um, certainly in Western North America. The site is called Danger Cave. It's located right off the 80 freeway in Wendover. <laughs> um, and it's, it has objects that date as old as 12,000 years ago. So that's pretty old for, um, for North America, Western North America especially. Um, but again, it's not a specific object. What archaeologists do is we'll date material that is within a stratigraphic layer. So this would have been at the very bottom of the cave sediments, and they probably dated some charcoal or maybe some plant material. Um, so they've been radiocarbon dating those materials. And it comes back with a date, say, 12,000 years ago. All the objects that are found in that layer are then associated with that date. So from what I recall in that layer, there was um, some stone tools, there was some cordage, um, there was even a little grinding implement. Um, so those, those objects are then kind of by associated dated to 12,000 years ago. Yeah, one, one object that we have in our exhibits, in fact, the very room that I'm in, First Peoples, um, is perhaps the oldest basket fragment in, um, in the American West. Yep. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to spot, Archer, but um, you and everyone else who's uh, watching us should keep an eye out for it because um, it, it's, it's really something quite special. Do you mind just telling people a little bit about that basket fragment? Sure, it's 
actually not a fragment. It's a complete basket. It's, it, you know, it's about the size of my hand like this. It's um, perfectly um, nicely um, coiled little basket. Um, the researchers found it kind of um, poking out of the, the sediment in the cave. This comes from Cowboy Cave, um, kind of in South Central Utah. And, um, and so they, they collected it, they were excavating the site, they collected it and dated it, and it came back as old as 9,000 years ago. And that is one of the oldest dated baskets in North America. Um, it is on exhibit. I've been really wanting to do residue analysis on it, <laughs> but um, it's very hard to get out of that exhibit case, so. <laughs> <laughs> But we are actually working on other basket fragments from that site. Those baskets aren't as old as that one, um, but we're getting some really interesting results. So I think based on those results, maybe the exhibits team will let me get in there and, and, and you know, sample that basket. I have no doubt that they will. <laughs> um, so Chris in Moab wants to know when the first humans arrived in Utah. And he's also interested in what kinds of plants they ate. That's a great question. Um, that's kind of a research question that's ongoing. Um, the early, in Utah, the earliest site, so there's Danger Cave, um, and then there's also North Creek Shelter, the site I was talking about before with the potato residue. Um, that's down in Southern Utah. Um, those are about equivalent in age. And, um, and it's interesting, there's not a lot of information about plant use in those really early levels. And that could be due to preservation. Um, you know, the older things get, they, they just don't hold together, especially little seeds and, and things like that. Um, but that's when residues come in handy because they do preserve better in, in collections and in, um, in objects. Um, so what I can say is that, um, there's little evidence of plant use, um, but it's, there aren't, what you don't find in those really early levels are the monos and the tades. And that tells you something about the importance of plants in the diet and that they were not intensifying plants back then. And that could be for a number of reasons. It could be that they were just moving around a lot. Um, it could be that they were relying more on animals and maybe marsh resources where you didn't need grinding implements. Um, and we just don't see, you know, much of um, that subsistence use in the archaeological record. Um, so, um, so there's not a lot of evidence for plant use. Um, and uh, was that the question? The yeah. old when we're, so yeah, I would say 12,000 years ago is when people first kind of came into Utah um, and not a great deal of plant use, but definitely some. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a best answer. <laughs> so I'm imagining, you know, in the, the Utah during the Pleistocene, uh, the time when, you know, humans first uh, appeared on, um, like I am imagining um, like cavemen, like hunting mammoths with spears. What, what do you, is that, uh, is that right? That's a hypothesis put out there. Um, there are definitely um, animal bones found in these caves that are mammoth. There's, I think, uh, maybe one or two um, actual associations between mammoth bones and, and stone tools. Um, um, there's even one in the desert west, um, the uh, uh, a stone tool that actually had um, blood residue of like the whatever the elephant family is, you know, so probably was mammoth in the past. Um, I think it was for presidium um, blood residue. Um, and so we know that these megafauna were walking across Utah, living here and, and all that. Um, the association of humans hunting them and um, or scavenging them, scavenging them are, are a is a little bit, you know, not, it's kind of up for debate. There's some evidence for it, um, 
But here in Utah, I think it's still up for debate. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, 12,000 years ago, um, we had a, a huge lake here in Utah. Um, I think it was starting to recede. We started getting these massive marsh systems, which are just, um, you know, wonderful um, pools of biodiversity in terms of plants and animals. Um, and so I don't think people were, um, you know, starving for little tiny seeds or anything like that. Um, and also just, you know, hunting mammoths would have been a very risky thing. So, um, but catching frogs and, and diving ducks would have been much, <laughs> much safer. So, <laughs> but that part of the story, you know, we're still uncovering, so. Yeah, and if um, Lisbeth mentioned um, that there's been some bifaces uh, that have uh, been found to perhaps have mammoth blood on them, those bifaces are gorgeous, they're huge, and they're on exhibit right now at the Natural History Museum of Utah. So be sure to, to come in and um, take a look at them. Uh, and um, and uh, those are you know perhaps a clue as to what people were eating 12,000 years ago. Um, I'm guessing it's not green jello. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another one of the really old sites. Those, those stone tools came from one of the really old sites. It's not a cave or rock shelter. It's an open site out on the Playa Desert. Um, but yeah, these beautiful basalt um, projectile points. And they're complete. Um, and uh, so yeah, they're right next, the new exhibit is right next to the... Um, the mammoth uh, skeleton there. Well, Vienna and Bountiful um, is curious about your latest discovery. Um, you know, wants to know what, what you've discovered, what you're working on right now. Yeah, so I have about uh, five students that are working in my lab right now, and they're working on various projects. Um, some of them are related to our potato project. Um, and. Part of that is looking for potato on other collections throughout the Four Corners region, including um, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, um, and a few other sites throughout Utah, and um, even in Arizona. Um, one of the newest discoveries that we found is um, looking at the different tools, if if you know of Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito is one of those great houses um, where people, it's thought that people came from all over to kind of gather there for festivals or ceremonies or rituals. Um, there's a lot of, been a lot of great recent research on, on Pueblo Benito. Um, and uh, we have um, stone tools from different rooms of this, um, gigantic great house. Um, and we're finding different starches on different tools from different rooms. Uh, and we're kind of wondering what that's about. It turns out three of the stone tools that we're looking at come from a room, room 28. This is the room where all of those hundreds of cylindrical jars um, were stashed and uh, Previous researchers have found um, cacao residue in those um, jars. And uh, so we're finding actually um, potato starch on some of these stone tools. And we know now from working with our Native American partners that the potato is actually not only good for food, but it is a, a lifeway medicine. So it does have ritualistic powers. Um, and it is used still today in ceremonies. So being able to connect those ancient uses to contemporary uses, um, I think is a really fascinating and kind of a new thing that we're just kind of coming upon. And I really am excited to, to work with our Native American partners um, about this new research um, and, and what it might mean. So, but that's very new and, you know, I don't want to get too excited about it, but that's something we're working on. It all comes back to the potato with you, doesn't it? I know. It's, it's true. That's why you're the, the potato queen. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Kate on Facebook wonders how you decide where the best spot to set up and excavate is. That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, like the caves and rock shelters, those are kind of obvious. Um, and those are kind of hot spots that, you know, you just go in and, and excavate. Um, but uh, other sites, you know, they could be found because somebody found something on the ground, um, maybe animal bones or stone tools. Um, and so they call a museum or the university or even their state history, historic, state history preservation office um, and tell them about it. And they will have somebody come out and look. Um, or the, the site North Creek Shelter in Southern Utah, and that's on private property. And um, the owner noticed some petroglyphs on, on the sandstone cliffs there. So she called a, a researcher and said, would you mind just coming to my property and taking a look? Turns out that site goes down three and a half meters deep and it's the oldest archeological site on the Colorado Plateau. Oh, wow. Yeah, so just a you know little tiny discovery can lead to a, a really important discovery. Um, doesn't always happen that way, but um, sometimes it does. And boy, howdy, when it does, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah. So keep right. it open. But I must remind you, if you do find archaeological objects on the ground, do not pick them up. Make a note of where you found it and call your, your local museum or um, the BLM if it's on public lands um, or call the State Historic Preservation Office and, and we'll get on it. My dad calls those leverites, as in leave them right there. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because again, without context, archaeology is nothing. <laughs> so Skyler on Facebook um, says, the American Southwest has such an amazing history. And he's wondering what the temporal and spatial breadth of our collections is and um, what the strengths of our collections is for research. That's a great question, Skylar. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, we have objects from all around Utah. So we have them from Southern Utah, which is um, where you have more of um, like the ancestral Puebloan um, communities and a lot of those kind of sites, um, like cliff dwellings. You don't get cliff dwellings up here in northern Utah. Um, so we have objects from down there. We have objects, um, you know, that are kind of in, um, in, um, sorry, I'm trying to think here, in western Utah, which is, um, well, I'll just say throughout Utah, um, more of the Fremont culture um, that is kind of very particular to Utah. And um, we have objects um, from Northern Utah, from some of the major cave sites. Um, so uh, we have, we cover the entire prehistory of Utah um, in terms of our archeological collections. Um, and, um, and so the scope of those collections, again, I would say the majority of our archaeological collections have research potential. Um, otherwise, we couldn't, probably would not be accepting them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, was there another part to that question or? Um, let's see here. I think he was also wondering kind of, so we have the, what's in our collection, uh, like the, the, the temporal and spatial breadth, and then also the strengths of our collection for research. Okay. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit more. So I mentioned, we just, we have collections from all around Utah. Um, we are the state museum, but there are other, um, credited museums around the state that have collections from other areas as well. Um, and the temporal span is, you know, as old as 12,000 years ago till today. The objects from, that are in our collection that date to 
Present times are part of our ethnographic collection. Um, both of these collections, which make up the anthropological collections, um, have enormous research potential. Again, we are a research institute and that is one of um, our missions is to be able to research these collections and say something about them. Um, and so you heard Glenna talking about our basketry collection in, in her interview. And um, I think our basketry collection is one of the most unique in probably North America where we have a, a consistent tradition or technique that um, has been produced here in Utah from as old as 9,000 years ago till today. And to be able to track changes in that technology, um, I think is really, um, has got a lot of research potential. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to learning more about, about that and connecting these different collections together. A, a few recent collections that we've we acquired connect kind of the ethnographic collection to the archeological collection. And it's um, a period in history we call the contact period. So this is when um, white settlers were first coming into Utah. Um, so we have some collections um, from John Wesley Powell when he was doing his Colorado and Green River expeditions. Those are from the 1800s. Um, and again, it's, it's bridging the more contemporary ethnographic collections to the archeological collections. Um, and that's uh, something we're working on is to getting more objects for that time period so that we can really track over time um, what people were doing and how they were living. That's great. Um, Elizabeth, we have so many questions uh, and do you, do you have maybe like 10 or 15 more minutes you can stick around and, and uh, so we can get through these? Absolutely. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Well, Peter in Salt Lake City is wondering how you can tell how the climate has varied over the past 12,000 years that humans has inhabited the Americas. So there's different ways. Um, I'm a paleoecologist as well as an archaeobotanist. So I was trained in pollen analysis. And again, these, these bags of sediments, <laughs> that holds the answer right there. Um, you can extract pollen grains from these bags of sediment, which again, are taken um, in depth throughout the site. So from the earliest deposits all the way through. Um, and for some of those sites that have, you know, quite an impressive stratigraphy, um, like Danger Cave that goes back from 12,000 years ago to proto-historic times, um, you can get a record of environmental change for that entire time. Um, we did that for North Creek Shelter down in Southern Utah and found a major climatic shift happening at around 9,300 years ago. Um, and this is when it got really dry in Utah, especially in Southern Utah, plant communities, um, we're moving upslope um, and uh, so that they can, you know, get to where it was cooler. Um, and then a lot of the um, lower elevation vegetation communities were also moving upslope. That tells us not only, yes, that environment was changing and all that, but it also tells us what kind of resources were um, available to people. Um, so Doing pollen analysis on sediments from archeological sites is, is one way. Um, doing pollen analysis on um, lake cores or bog cores. These are kind of columns of sediment that you extract from a, a lake or a bog. And then you sample um, that sediment, that kind of long column. Um, and you look at the different pollen grains from different plant taxa that produce them. And that will tell you, again, what, what plants are going, growing near that lake or bog during that particular time. Um, also looking at mammal bones, um, especially small mammal bones, which respond, they're very sensitive to climatic change. Um, uh, our our um, archeological sites have a lot of um, small mammal bones. Also our paleontological sites have a lot of small mammal bones. And so looking at those little bones, and I think you heard a little bit about that from Tyler's video on caving. 
um, but you look at the different taxa represented by those bones and it tells you what little small critters were, were living near that, that cave um, long ago. And it'll tell you again, what, what kind of climatic um, environment was like. Um, I'm sure I'm thinking I, there's others, but those are kind of the ones that are on the top of my head. So there's multiple ways at getting at um, what the climate was like. So there's like, just by, just by knowing what the plants and animals were throughout time, we can make a bunch of inferences about what the climate was like and also how the climate has changed over time. I think that's kind of one of the cool things about a natural history museum collection, isn't it? That, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, we collect plants and animals over a long period of time. So we're able to kind of look back and see how things have changed. That's absolutely right. And that's something that connects all of our collections is that we, we all are looking at, you know, this change through time, whether it's for paleontology millions of years ago or in anthropology thousands of years ago. Um, but we're all interested in change through time and, and how either people or small mammals adjusted to these dramatic climatic changes. Yeah, and in that way, the study of archaeology is is so much more than just archaeology, isn't it? It's oh, also yeah. the the study of of plants and animals and geology. Yeah, and that's why you know um, a woman asked earlier, you know, how did you get into it, or, or what do you do? Um, you know, you can you can come into archaeology in different from different paths. And you, once you're in that field, you can take different paths. It's a really um, fun discipline in that way. And like I said, it, it leads you to collaborating with different disciplines that you never thought you'd collaborate with. Um, I mean, I collaborate with plant geneticists. I collaborate with agriculturalists. I collaborate with phytochemists, botanists, geologists, geographers. Um, and But to, what I believe is that in order to really get a full picture of what's going on in the past, because the past is very complex, you have to have, you have to take a multidisciplinary view of it. You can't just look from one discipline and, and be able to say um, that you have the full answer to that. There's just no way. So again, like what you're saying, Paul Michael, that's the importance of these natural history collections is that they're made up of multiple different disciplines and then you have people who work in those disciplines that can work together on a kind of a common problem um, and and that's that's how we're going to uncover the past dave in washington terrace wonders what has been learned from the 12,000 year old campsite excavated in the west desert do you know which okay. one he's talking about yeah so that's the one that uncovered those really nice basalt projectile points. Um, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so that work, so that's out on Hill Air Force Base, um, out on the De Playa Desert. Um, and they've found some of the um, earliest um, projectile points that were in a buried context. Oftentimes we find like projectile points like Clovis points on the surface. Um, and it's hard to, uh, you know, date that because it's, it's just on the surface and you kind of have to use typology to date it. But these are actually um, buried um, in subsurface deposits. And so you, they were able to date some of the um, charcoal remains. And so they were able to directly associate those stone tools. And they are very old, as old as 12,000 years ago. Um, so, um, that, that site's a very cool site because again, 12,000 years ago, that was not a playa desert. <laughs> that was a very rich, um, marsh system, huge, expansive marsh system. Because again, when this log, Lake Bonneville, um, receded, it exposed these massive wetlands and people were camping out on those wetlands because there's just so many resources, um, you know, to eat there. So um, that was a really exciting find because um, it's 
It's one of the earliest, you know, not cave or rock shelter, but still subsurface um, sites that um, would have been right on the, the marsh deposits. Coleman in Salt Lake is wondering, what do you think is the most interesting item in the museum? And and before you say it's me, um, you know, let's just say that I'm you know disqualified from that answer. <laughs> you are very interesting, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you know, I I'm drawn to um, I'm drawn to the other collections. Actually, I actually do a lot of work in the herbarium, and I love seeing. Um, herbarium sheets from these really early explorers. Um, now, they're not in our collection, but I, I did do some work um, at Kew Gardens in London, and they actually had plants collected by John C. Fremont, who came through Utah. He's a very well-known explorer. Um, they, they had plants collected by Charles Darwin. Um, I, I, I just love that um, Museum collections preserve these um, pieces of the past. Um, so I guess I don't have a, really an answer in terms of uh, in our museum. Um, I, I guess I don't have an object, but I, I just love the stories behind some of these objects. And I love the really old stories about these old explorers, old collectors, um, and there's one I'm really interested in, um, a woman, um, actually a woman explorer who came to the Four Corners region, um, I think in the early 1900s, and she collected Selenum Jamesii. So I have this kind of personal connection with her. This woman's name is Alice Eastwood, and she's a very um, interesting, you should Google her, very interesting um, uh, person. Um, What's her name again? Alice Eastwood. Alice Eastwood, okay. Yeah, she's got I, plants named after her, Eastwoodie, for example, just like Fremont did, Fremonti. Um, so anyway, I, I like the stories behind some of these, these really old objects and specimens. Now, if folks want to uh, check out um, some of the amazing botany and mycology collections that we have here at the museum, um, we have all kinds of uh, uh, resources on our behind the scenes web pages. And also you can join us Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, November 17th, um, to hear uh, uh, more about botany and to see some of those beautiful uh, oppressed plants um, with just, just immeasurable like beauty and history. Um, and not only, not only that, but and scientific value too. All right, um, so uh, Melanie on uh, Facebook Live is wondering how can a regular citizen participate in archeology? span That's a great question. I know there are a lot of opportunities um, for volunteering in archeology, span especially if there's like a big dig happening. Um, I know BYU, sometimes um, their big digs have um, kind of like volunteer day. Um, I know our state historic preservation office also has um, opportunities for volunteers on some of their excavations. Um, and we would too, uh, we don't have any um, active excavations happening right now. Doesn't mean there won't be in, in the future. Um, but we definitely um, have opportunities for volunteers. We have a, a, a lot of volunteers in the anthropology department here at the museum. And I mean, we would not get anything done without those volunteers. Like they, they are our workforce. So they're very valuable to us. Um, um, but in terms of archeological field work, um, yeah, you kind of have to find the right um, opportunity and I'm, I often know of, of digs happening and I can always reach out and find out if they have um, opportunities for volunteers. Um, so I would just reach out to, you know, to me or, or to other people at the university or the, the State Historic Preservation Office and I'm sure you could find something. 
Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't know that was possible. Sign me up. Jeez Louise, that would be amazing. You could also probably sign up for a field school um, as a student and you can actually, that's in a way volunteering, you're kind of paying to do it. Um, but there you'll, you'll really learn all about archeology. span so Melanie, keep a, an eye on, go to our museum's website and uh, we have all the volunteer positions posted there as they come up. So keep an eye on that and fingers crossed, maybe there'll be some opportunity uh, for you to join Lisbeth on a dig. Danielle um, uh, on Facebook Live is wondering if you're able to integrate your own research findings into the museum exhibits. Um, and what does that process look like? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our exhibits team is amazing. Um, if you come to our museum, you know that. <laughs> um, but they do a really great job of integrating um, our own research with the exhibits. And um, we have a new exhibit. It's been around for maybe a year or two called News from Our Scientists. And it's um, right next to the Utah Futures exhibit. And um, there we highlight um, recent research by you know, anybody within any of the collections. Um, and that's rotating every six months. So that's the exhibit that has kind of the most recent upcoming research um, happening. Um, but um, I know that, you know, things, the exhibits, especially in our permanent exhibits, you know, those don't change out as much. But I do know that there are little changes that are always happening. And they're always updating those with the most recent research and trying to incorporate our own research. So the uh, example Paul Michael brought up about the um, mammoth exhibit, um, that's brand new and that's based on very recent research. So um, yeah, you, they're, they're around and, and yes, they incorporate our research. So we're very lucky to, to have that. Tammy on Facebook is wondering if you use any molecular biology techniques to analyze your findings. Um, well, I, like I said, I, I work with plant geneticists um, and uh, so they definitely use molecular biology. Um, I, I don't personally, um, but I collaborate with those who do. Um, our curator of mycology, um, Bren Dittinger, he, he definitely uses um, those tools in his research as well. Okay, Mari in Sandy is curious, what kind of technology is used to analyze archeological samples such as soil? And uh, she's wondering, is it IRMS analysis, mass spectrometry or something else? Yeah, so um, yeah, these bags of sediment, like I said, are, are <laughs> they have a lot of information in here. Um, there could be bits of charcoal that you could radiocarbon date. Um, and yes, you could, you know, use mass spectrometry um, for that. Um, there's also um, another dating technique called optical luminescence or OSL, optical stimulating luminescence, I believe. <laughs> um, and that's another dating technique used on actually sand. Um, but usually you have to have um, samples that have not been exposed to light. Um, so probably when these were excavated back in the 70s, those, they were exposed to light. Um, uh, and um, other type of analyses, um, I've already mentioned pollen grain, starch residue, other macrobotanical, um, microfaunal remains. Oftentimes there's little tiny fragments of animal bone in here that people can identify. Um, there's often little debitage. Debitage is little tiny flakes of um, chipstone tools. And again, there are people that specialize in analyzing these tiny little bits of stone um, because this debitage patterns often tells you something about the tools they are making. Um, so lots of different, you can 
there's lots of different techniques you can use on, on sediments. Um, again, that's why it's so valuable to have these in our collections so that people can come back to them and, and analyze them. Susie from Southern Utah on uh, YouTube is wondering if uh, you know whether Utah's first people used ephedra or Mormon tea in their diets. Yeah, ephedra is, um, does show up quite often in archaeological sites. And um, it's um, the little um, stems or, or branches of, of ephedra. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know of any examples where they've actually found um, like residue of Mormon tea. I don't know if you ever would, um, but there's de de definitely ephedra has shown up in, in archaeological sites across Utah. So it's, it's one of those really important plants for sure. Dana watching on Facebook and Denise in West Valley and Amy in Salt Lake all have the same question. They want to know where they can find the Four Corners potato to plant and perhaps eat. And as a side note, Amy has a small farm and restaurant. It, in Salt Lake City, she does? I think so. Cool. Well, um, so we have another grant, and this is with the, um, actually the Department of, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. Um, of, it's like the Department of Agriculture, but it's here in the state of, of Utah um, under the umbrella of, of the USDA. Um, and that, that grant is developing the Four Corners potato for market. Now we are working with our Native American um, partners so that they can grow it in their gardens on reservation land. We believe they are truly the stewards of this potato. We believe that the potato populations that exist in Utah exist because um, they managed and tended this plant for thousands of years. So we, um, we're working with them to let them grow the potatoes, um, again, on their own gardens, on, their, on the reservation and for them to grow enough and harvest enough to then distribute to restaurants um, or to other farms. Now, unfortunately, those operations got halted because of COVID-19. And as you know, um, especially Navajo Reservation got hit very hard with COVID-19. So we weren't able to get all those operations um, up to speed. And I should say also that this project is really run by Dr. Bruce Pavlik at, at Red Butte Garden. He's been working very closely on propagating this potato in the Red Butte Garden greenhouses. Um, but that's that's the goal. So we're we're letting um, we're having the Native American communities grow it first and try to get a big enough crop to distribute to restaurants. Um, and it's, it's going slower than usual because of things that we can't control. Um, if, if a vaccine is gonna be available, we can take up operations again, maybe late spring, early summer. Um, and hopefully that would get us in time for harvest for next fall. Um, so we'll see. But um, keep your eyes and ears open because there might be, um, a chance where they will be on the market and be available for you to buy. All right, Dana, <laughs> Denise, and Amy, stay tuned for the Four Quarters potato that might be on your plate sometime soon. And there have been other restaurants that have served the Four Corners potato, by the way. Um, Hell's Backbone Grill served it on their Thanksgiving dinner last year. And um, Twin Rocks Cafe has sit, served it in a few of their dinner events. Um, and we serve it um, yearly at the Indigenous um, Foods Dinner um, that the Utah Dene Bikea puts on. So it's, it's getting out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dania, Daniel on Facebook is asking, based on the archeological evidence, what do we know about pottery trade between Utah and other cultures? We know it happened. 
not the expert. If if my colleague, Dr. Glenna Nielsen Grimm was here, she would be able to tell you all about that. But I, I do know that um, pottery is one of the main objects that was traded. Um, and there's a lot of research on that. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I don't think there's just one direction of trade. I think kind of um, the Southwest and Four Corners region, trade was happening, you know, south to north, north to south, east to west, west to east, so um, all around. And pottery is just one of the things that was traded. I mean, we think the potato was traded, but we also know um, cacao was, uh, shell beads were, um, salt, scarlet macaws, um, lots of objects like that. Yeah, I remember um, uh, some of those cradle boards that we were talking about earlier have those Russian blue beads on them that came from yeah. Russia. And I was just floored that beads were from Russia made their way all the way to Utah and into our collection. Yeah, that's the fur traders. So um, yeah, definitely see evidence of, of that. There's a whole um, field of research dedicated just to trade networks um, in the desert west. Alan in Tooele wonders, besides the Four Corners potato, are there any other wild relatives to current Utah crops that should be conserved? Wild relatives to, hmm, um, well, there's one that kind of comes to mind, um, but I wouldn't call it a crop really. Um, so we're all familiar with quinoa. Um, this is a plant, you know, the little tiny seeds and fruits that you, you eat. Um, the genus for that is Quinopodium quinoa. And that was really um, domesticated and intensively used in South America. Uh, we have other genera um, or other species of that same genus that grow here in Utah. Um, many different species of quinopodium that grow here in Utah. Um, now in the Eastern North America, they actually found evidence that quinopodium berlanduri, um, and again, the, the seeds look exactly like quinoa, it might be a little bit smaller, but they found that that was domesticated. And, um, and so, and we have that same species here. That's something that I started working on is um, trying to examine because quinopodium seeds are very, um, they occur very frequently in a lot of sites in, in, um, in our area. And, um, and you can answer uh, that question, you know, was, was this species domesticated here? And there's ways to answer that. Um, so that would be another crop that I could, that I think, that I can think about that is, is wild today, but might have been domesticated in the past. Um, and maybe even, you know, used as a crop like quinoa or as a grain like quinoa. Interesting. Um, speaking of uh, Russia, Anastasia in Sandy is wondering if we have any artifacts from Russia in our collection. Ooh. Besides the Russian trade beads, I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I probably not. But what an interesting question! It'd be fun to to, to kind of go through the databases and and look. Yeah, I, I I will do that. But that one does not come up as like an area that I I can remember. Now, if Glenn were here, she might be able to. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. Um, Owen in Salt Lake wonders if we know how many artifacts have been collected from Utah excavation sites. Um, and, you know, he, he uh, says it's probably a hard question to answer, and he's absolutely right. That is a very hard question to answer. But um, do you have any sense on that, Elizabeth? I mean, hundreds of thousands. Um, it really depends on, on the site. Um, I can give you examples of some of our largest collections from archaeological sites. Um, you know, Danger Cave, um, uh, Floating Island Shelter, uh, Homestead Cave, these all have a, over a hundred boxes of objects. 
or bags of sediment. Um, that's a huge collection. <laughs> so that's a lot of objects. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it yeah, it just depends on, on the site, but that's typically means a large collection, so over a hundred boxes. Uh, Alexis in Los Angeles is wondering about um, uh, uh, art. Um, are there different representations of art that you found from the first peoples in Utah? Oh, okay. So that kind of like really old, old art. <laughs> old, old art. <laughs> We've got a lot of amazing, more contemporary art in our ethnographic collections. Um, but prehistoric art, that's, you know, that can, it can be subjective. Um, and a lot of times, you know, there's rock art. Um, so a lot of times people um, interpret rock art as art. Other times people interpret it as actually communicating something. Um, I'm not on the up and up on that field. Um, and I think it's just really hard to know how to interpret rock art. Um, but that would, I guess, be one form of art. Um, I have a very broad definition of art. I think basket weaving, basket weaving is an art. And I think the people when they first came to Utah were extraordinary basket makers. Um, they knew how to weave um, really well and um, very intricately. And um, again, we see basket weavers today um, doing, doing that same practice. Um, and we know, because we know those artists, that that kind of skill um, is hard to come by and it's passed on by generation to generation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess it, it depends on what your definition of art is. Um, trying to think if there's um, other examples um, that I can think of, but not off the top of my head. <laughs> All right. Um, well, the, the last question of the night goes to Bennett in Salt Lake City, and he wants to know how much validity is there to the theory of people crossing the Bering Straits into North America? Well, yeah, so that's one of the main hypotheses about how people entered North America. Um, there's other different routes suggested, such as the coastal route or um, people coming across from Polynesia into South America and making their way up, um, or people crossing the Atlantic Ocean, coming into North America, which I don't really, I don't believe that. <laughs> um, but the, there is the most evidence for um, the Bering Land Bridge um, hypothesis, and that's how people came in. And it's, um, and it's probably the most um, widely accepted hypothesis because there's so much evidence that points to that. Um, genetic evidence, um, paleoecological evidence, archeological evidence, um, stone tool evidence, dating of sites. Um, so we have some of the earliest sites up in Alaska, um, which would give, um, which would make sense if, if the first peoples were coming that way. But there's always, um, there's always flies in the ointment, right? So there's a really, really early site down in Chile that's as early as some of these sites in Alaska. Now, how does that happen? Is it possible that there is multiple routes into North America or into the Americas? Yes, perhaps, um, because I don't know how else to explain people entering the Bering Land Bridge and making it all the way down to Southern Chile within, you know, within a generation. Um, I guess it's possible. Um, so, uh, so yes, I the most widely accepted hypothesis is that people came in through the Bering Land Bridge, but there are other hypotheses out there. And the coastal route one is one that's getting a lot of um, attention these days. Ooh, that was a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, be sure to join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as Ty and Jason take us into the vertebrates collection. 
If you haven't already, be sure to explore behind the scenes reimagined on our website. There you'll find photo galleries, videos, stories, and 3D models, all showcasing the scientists, the collections and research that goes on behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. And remember, stay curious. Bye, everybody.